Can everybody hear me? Um, I could go on and on about Mary Daly, but I'll just say this. A year ago, Lauren and I were talking, and I said, you know who my absolute dream guest for the 40th Annual Economic Roundtable would be? It's Mary Daly. And this feels like a dream come true, and I'm just so thrilled to be sitting here with you and having this opportunity to talk with you. Well, thank you so much. That's uh, extremely flattering. I really appreciate it. And I actually feel like, oh, wow, I've already accomplished part of my bucket list. Make a dream come true, and it's only January. So I'm already check. in. So I'm check. check. I'm absolutely. in good shape. Hopefully absolutely. year goes well. All right. So let's just jump into it. Sure, I think absolutely. I'd, first, I'd love to hear, and I think we'd all love to hear, your outlook for the economy. You know, what are the takeaways, the key takeaways from 2023? What's your forecast for 2024? Absolutely. So let me start with uh, 2023. So remember, we began the year last year with high inflation and a booming labor market, and we were tightening policy at a rapid clip. And the, con the conversation then was, will the Fed's tightening cycle fail and inflation will just completely never come back down, or will we have a recession? And that was the context. And the sentiment was pretty low, despite the fact that the economy was booming. And I would go out and do CEO roundtables, community talks, and what I'd hear is, it's too frothy. It's unsustainable. I had visuals given to me. One man, one gentleman said, I feel like I'm riding a bike when I was a kid, and I've lost the pedals. You know, those bikes where you lose the pedals, and it's just going down the hill, and there's nothing you can do, and you just hope for the best and hang on. And then another young man who I met at a local retail outlet, he was there with his wife and two kids. And they were there on a Sunday shopping. And he said, and I, you know, I, I'm asking him questions, don't identify what I do for a living, but I told him I was an economist. And I'm interested in how people are experiencing the economy. And he said, I feel like I'm on a treadmill. I'm on a treadmill because I'm making more money than I've ever made. I'm working two or three jobs. I have no more hours in the day. And when I come here to buy groceries, there is less and less in my cart, and I'm spending more and more of my income. And he said, I can't keep this up. I want to do better. What can I do? And I told this young man, which was a heartfelt rendering he was giving me about his life, I said, I'm working on it. <laughs> it's going to take some time. Keep at it. Now, I don't know what happened to that young man, but I do know what happened to the economy. Throughout 2023, we, even with the banking stresses, which gave us another negative we had to work through, we end the year, end 23, with inflation much, much lower. People not yet, we're not there yet, and I'll talk about that in a moment, but it's much, much lower in American families and businesses and communities are feeling a relief from that high inflation stress. We also end it with the economy starting to slow. So it looks like that froth is gone. And that froth being gone actually helps people feel like, okay, now I can get a foothold and I get a plan. So now where are we today in 2024 and where do I see us going? Well, I'm gonna start with a couple of things. The economy is in a really good place. If you saw the sentiment numbers, the confidence numbers this week that come from the various surveys, people feel better. There was last month a vibe session. That was the last thing I was hearing about. Kyla Scanlon taught me this. Uh, she's a, an influencer, a journalistic person who does a lot of TikTok and things, and she tells me, oh, it's a vibe session. People feel bad, the data are good, it's a bad vibe. And, and I, that was six months ago, and I think, I, okay, I'm listening, but now, I'm seeing sentiment data and confidence data be better. When I had a business roundtable here in San Diego this morning, what did I hear? Cautious optimism. I'm seeing an economy that is responding to monetary policy and coming into balance and inflation coming down, but not falling off the, the cliff and making a worrisome situation, and that's good. The second thing that I feel is in a good place is policy. Policy's in a good place. We got policy rate adjusted so it can do its work. We see that it is having an influence. And so now we're in a great place in the following situation. We know that policy's in a good place, the economy's in a good place, and we can start to be more patient to see what we need as a Fed to do next. The other thing that we can do is we can take a deep breath. 
and we can say, what are the important work we need to do as communities, as people, as businesses, to plan for our future? And that's the second thing I heard in the round table this morning that I really wanted to share, is that we had a lot of conversations about things that we were going to do to build our future forward. When I was at CEO Roundtables last year, I only heard about inflation and how hard it was to hire anybody. Now I'm hearing, well, what about workforce housing? What about education? What about making our communities strong and vibrant and building an ecosystem? So, you know, I'm not a, I'm optimistic by nature, but I'm, I always tether myself to evidence. I am an evidence-based optimist. And I would say that the economy and the situation looks brighter than it did at the beginning of last year. There is a lot of work to do. There is no denying it. And I'm gonna do my part at the Fed, but it's a lot of work to do for all of us to really get to where we wanna be. But we're starting from a better place, for sure. I hope that helps. That, that helps a lot. Uh, for those who might not be familiar, um, President Daly, in addition to being President and CEO of the San, of the San Francisco Fed um, is also one of 12 voting members of the Federal Open Market Committee, which arguably makes her one of the 12 most influential economic policymakers in the world. Um, uh, the the FOM, FOMC um, kind of sets interest rates, and so that has a huge impact on our economy. And and the you as part of that um, have a kind of a dual mandate, right? One is to keep inflation low. And the other is to maintain full employment or to keep unemployment low. Um, when you look at the year ahead, which one of those seems more daunting or which one seems more like a risk or which clearly in 2023 your focus was inflation? What, what do you see when you see? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. So we, you're right. We have a, what we call the dual mandate. If you follow the Fed, you've heard about the dual mandate, full employment, price stability. If you're ever talking to people at, at in your friends and family, um, you can ex we explain it this way when you know people aren't Fed followers necessarily, is that everyone who wants a job can have one, that's full employment, and the dollar in your pocket or your wallet holds its value, that's price stability. So for us, last year, inflation is, was so far above our target, and the labor market was booming, as I said, firms were telling us they couldn't find workers, and workers were telling us they could have every job they wanted. So that was a, an economy where our only focus to, to achieve our goals needed to be inflation. And so we, we had that in mind, vigilance and resolute commitment to getting inflation down. At this point, with the economy in a good place, the risks more balanced, and the um, policy in a good place, what's happened is that dual mandate is back in um, a collective lens, right? I'm looking at both. Because what I wanna do is I wanna make sure that we deliver on low inflation but do it without taking jobs by making the unemployment rate rise. So I would say that we're balancing those goals at this point. The risks to the economy are balanced and the risks to both sides of our mandate are balanced. So we don't wanna loosen policy too quickly only to find that inflation gets stuck at way above target. That would be a miss. That would be a very scarring miss. And we don't want to try to get to two so quickly like overnight, just to get that squeezed out, that we end up having this big run up in the unemployment rate, and then we've solved one problem for people, we brought inflation down, but we've given them another problem, we've taken their jobs. That is not um, a soft landing, in case you're wondering. And we want definitely to, um, just in case, you're, you don't know, but we definitely want, and it's so, because a soft landing is more. I mean, the reason I spent so much time talking to people is because, to really understand what a soft landing means, you have to look at the eyes of people who want two things. You have to think of that gentleman I met in Walmart. Well, I shouldn't have said that. Um, <laughs> that gentleman I met at the large retail outlet. Um, <laughs> you, have to, you, but you have to think about that, and you have to think about that gentleman. And if we end up having an economy that delivers on 2% inflation and takes away jobs, we haven't made him any better off. In fact, maybe worse off. And so that's the commitment to the dual mandate, and I think both of those goals are in balance. 
Yeah, speaking of the uh, soft landing, that's all we heard last year. So are, are they going to achieve the soft landing? The, the window for a soft landing is getting narrower and narrower. And then all of a sudden people are saying, oh, it's immaculate disinflation. You pulled it off. You know, you did this incredible. You did the impossible. Do you feel like you've achieved the soft landing or is there continuing risk? No, okay. no, no, no. So if anybody <laughs> asks, the golden chalice is not yet ours, right? We do not declare victory. I think it's very important, and I mean this with all um, seriousness, there's a cost to declaring victory too soon. There's, a, there's so many costs, but say that we say there's victory. Well, then what we could end up with is inflation getting stuck at 3.9%, which is what it just printed, right? That's not price stability. 3.9% is not price stability. 2% is our target for price stability. So there's a gap. That's a 1.9 percentage point gap. There's a lot of work to do there. That doesn't mean that we don't have the tools or we're not getting closer. We are definitely getting closer. Look at all the progress we made last year. It just means we have to stick with it. We have to continue to work on it, and we have to do that in a different way than we did last year because this year we also have to keep our eyes on the labor market, which is starting to slow. And so we have to calibrate very carefully to ensure that we continue to bring inflation down and we ensure that we do it gently as gently as we possibly can. So I, I say that the job is, is really one about calibration this year. What does it take? It takes patience. It takes gradualism. Uh, there's this word, term used in monetary policy. Ben Bernanke wrote a speech about it called gradualism. And the gradualism just means you take the time to look. You're facing a lot of uncertainty. You make sure you really get a look at the data, you look at it, you study it, you, you do it twice, three times, and then you take action. Because if you're quick to act, you can actually make mistakes. And mistakes aren't just things that they'll write about in history books, they're things that affect people, their lives and livelihoods. You mentioned that we haven't yet achieved that 2% price stability, or 2% inflation rate. What's keeping it elevated right now? You know, why is it 3.9 versus 2? Oh, that's a, that's yeah. a great question. So, and you know, I love detailed questions like that. I'm an economist by trading, so who doesn't want to talk about the composition of inflation? Uh, probably <laughs> you, everyone. probably you, but I'm going to talk about it anyway to make it fun. And you can tell me, I'll, I'll ask for a show of hands, is it really fun? Okay, so really, uh, it's actually very interesting and extraordinarily useful in the post-pandemic management of the high inflation. It's quite a bit different than how it's historically been. So pandemic comes, as we all know, and it basically shuts down the economy. And when it shuts down the economy, it, it simply destroys supply chains across the globe. It stymies demand, but then quickly two things happen. Uh, federal relief comes in and supports families who didn't have incomes. And the rest of us who did have incomes because we kept our jobs just went home and worked. And then we masked up in piles of savings that we didn't ordinarily have because we had nowhere to go. And we did drain off some of those savings by going online and spending an enormous amount of time buying things, physical things, bicycles, stationary bikes, TVs, headphones, so when we're all fighting over the TV, you know, everybody has their own <laughs> headphones, um, Zoom equipment. I mean, in my family, we bought a lot of stuff, as did every other American family, right? Everybody bought a lot of stuff. And what was interesting is the the switch of our spending as Americans, the pattern of our spending, it shifted quite dramatically away from services and to things, to, to goods. That is very unusual. Two thirds of spending is on services and only a third on, on goods. That shifted, half and half. Okay, so then what, what does that mean? Well, that means that demand for goods, things, is growing rapidly while supply of things is completely faltered. And that's inflationary. So goods price inflation shot up. We've been used to computer prices falling, bicycle prices falling, TV prices falling, even car prices falling. Those things all rose in price while that was happening. Okay, so that's thing one. Second thing that happened, huh? The microphone a little closer. Oh, sorry, guys. Um, second thing that happened, I couldn't tell. It's, it's sort of, I, I have no idea what I'm doing, so. It, it, with the microphone, with the microphone. I'm very, very capable at monetary policy. <laughs> Just be <being> clear. <laughs> okay, back to it. So, so goods price inflation rises rapidly. The second thing that happens is that people, 
and this is really important, people want bigger houses. They want a lot of housing. Now they have money, so they go out and they're buying houses hand over fist. Housing prices are going up, so that boosts housing price inflation and rental price inflation as people move out of cities and they move into bigger areas where they feel like they have more outdoor space or just bigger environments because it's the pandemic. So that's happening. And then the third thing that happens is that labor, people working, especially in in-person settings, people are afraid. They don't want to come to work and it's challenging. And so all of those workers, many of them just simply leave the labor force. They retire if they're older, they simply leave and go home if they're not, and that leaves a big hole in the labor force. That happens at the same time that demand for low, lower wage workers has gone up because we have all these need for Amazon drivers and, and you know all the delivery services that we're getting to our home, food delivery, goods delivery, and so this is just a big imbalance between demand and supply. And both of those things, in housing and in services other than housing, that completely boosts uh, core services inflation. So then we end up with core services inflation high, core goods inflation high, and an economy that is growing and there's no sign of relief. So we raise the interest rate, and what happens is, while we're raising the interest rate to get the demand side of this back in balance, the supply chains also recover. So now, last year, what we had is goods price inflation came down, largely because the supply of goods started to come back through. Shipping improved, factories opened, the supply chains recovered, goods price inflation come down. At the same time, demand for goods started to wane, and people shifted back over to services, and what's happening is more workers are coming to work now, wages have been rising, tracks people into the labor market, and the Fed's raised interest rates, and so people are, just demand is in general slowing. So right now, two things are happening. Goods price inflation is coming down and services price inflation is coming down, both for housing and also for these other services. And that is, while others may call it an immaculate disinflation, I call it a, a purposeful more march towards the normalization that comes from the post-pandemic supply chain recovery and the normal way that Fed policy rates work. You raise interest rates, demand slows. Not quite as catchy of a name as immaculate disinflation. Well, you know, I when like you're a policymaker, like no. if you look for a catchy name, you're typically going to be too narrow in your thinking and you're going to be wrong, so I'll leave that to the media guys who uh, <laughs> dream those things up, but it is catchy, immaculate disinflation. It just isn't immaculate. Yeah. It was purposeful. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you wrote a great paper um, called The Economic Gains from Equity, and for the nerds in the audience, uh, I encourage you to go read this paper. I, I'd love to hear from you, why should we care about racial equity and what can we do to address it? So let me say that when gaps in, in groups, whether it's race, ethnicity, gender, rural, urban, um, any location, you can look at gaps between people who are first generation college students and other college graduates. You can think of so many places where there's gaps in opportunity. And why does that matter? Because talent is distributed evenly across the population in all likelihood. Why wouldn't it be, right? And if talent's evenly distributed and you see gaps in opportunity, that means we're maybe missing the best coder ever to, to walk the earth. Might be living in rural Idaho and we don't even know that person's there because they have never been given an opportunity to touch a keyboard or to give it a try. And so my, the concept of equity, the gains from equity, is that we're leaving talent on the table. When opportunities aren't even, talent is regularly left on the table and we can't afford that. We're a nation that needs a growing and higher quality labor force. We need increased productivity to ensure that the, the pie for the next generation, the economic pie, is larger than the one we inherited. So, you know, the point of writing that paper is to say, closing these gaps is not simply about fairness. Closing those gaps is about the economic well-being of our, of our society. And that is something that is easy, I think, for all of us to commit to. We need to do that, which is our responsibility to the next generation. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, by, by many tra Thank you. Uh, 
by many traditional measures, GDP and unemployment, the economy is doing well. You talked about the vibe earlier, right? There's still a sense among many people, although maybe sentiment, consumer sentiment is improving, there's still a sense among many of us that, that the economy doesn't work for all of us. And, um, you know, housing and childcare are unaffordable, middle class jobs are often inaccessible without a very expensive college education. Um, how do you reconcile those two views of the economy? Whether the economy, is, is the economy booming? Is the economy busting? What's, sure. what's, yeah. So, you know, one thing that I think I find helpful, and when you talk with people and you dig in, you can see this. So, last year, it didn't feel like it was working anywhere, right? Even in the basic thing, like my gentleman who was at the retail outlet, He's working his jobs, he's making better money, and he still doesn't get to do what he wants to do, or, and he still feels like he's on that treadmill. Right now, I do feel like people are stepping off the treadmill a little bit, and just as they walk, they gain ground, they're not on that treadmill. But it doesn't mean, and that's, a, that's what we call the cyclical part of the economy, right? Cyclically, we're getting in a better place. The inflation rate's coming down, things are getting better, we're better off. What's still hard, though, is we face these structural things about how the economy works that need, need treatment. And we spent a lot of time at the roundtable I, that I had this morning with business leaders talking about things like, how do we create an ecosystem? These are things that, in, that business leaders brought up to me. The ecosystem that says, okay, I can offer a job. I can offer training. Where's the workforce housing? that makes that equation complete. So if my hiring barrier isn't how much I can pay or I can't, or, or is a worker skilled, it's can they afford to live near the place that I'm offering to work, well then that's a barrier that will take a public, private, community partnership to create the right ecosystem. And those are challenges that we haven't had to, we, well, we they were there before the pandemic, but now, the pandemic and the post-pandemic recovery has put a bright spotlight on them. And that's not something that's just here in San Diego. That's anywhere you go in the 12th district. I have nine states in the Western United States and I travel across the world and, and across the United States. I see the same problems in same places. Communities everywhere are struggling with, how do we make sure we have enough housing for our populations? How do we make sure that housing is at price points where various parts of the workforce can afford it? How do we get the right skills to the right places? The reason I focus so, well, these are the jobs I have. I have one tool, the interest rate, and I have two responsibilities, full employment and price stability. It's a narrow lane, but it's an important lane. The reason it's so important is that none of those things you just mentioned that actually, that I, and we just talked about, that solve people's feeling the economy doesn't work for them, are even on the radar when inflation is 7%. Mm -hmm. They just aren't even talked about. They get swept aside while people frantically try to creep, keep up. Now, as inflation's coming down, we can start to bring those things back to the forefront, and I can turn the job then back to you all who are working in localities and communities and states and my, our fiscal agent uh, com, you know, folks in, in Congress and in state legislatures to really take on this other work, which is we're through the pandemic, the worst of the inflation um, surge is behind us. Okay, now what do we do next? Speaking of what we can do next and what we can do locally, um, as Chairwoman Vargas mentioned, you know, San Diego's really big. It's the fifth largest county in America. 1% exactly of all Americans live here in San Diego County. Um, and it's incredibly diverse. What can we do here to make our economy stronger, more resilient, more equitable? What can policymakers, businesses, educational institutions, nonprofits, what can we all do locally to improve our economy? So one thing that I see, and I see this all over when I travel the district, is just what we're doing here. Come together, talk, learn from each other. You have an opportunity to meet people who don't work in your industry or business, because ultimately what I see in any of the successful communities that solve problems is you get right to the heart. It takes partnerships. It is very challenging for the government alone to do something, whether it's the local, state, or federal government, or just businesses alone to do something, or community groups alone to do something. You have to build these partnerships and say, collectively, what do we do? The second thing that I, 
I think is, is really important, and I, I learned this in my own organization. You know, I, I have a lot of ideas. I, I've stopped saying I have a lot of good ideas. I just say I have a lot of ideas <laughs> about what we can do. And then I, what, what was really important is you have to pick two or three to all swim in the same direction to say, okay, what are we going to accomplish? And I think we, we probably don't do enough of that in our communities to say, oh, we have all these leaders here. What two or three things are we going to put all of our weight behind collectively because they're the most pressing things to do? So those are just some basic things. I will say this, though, and I told you this when we were giving a chat, having a chat before the, the, for this event. You know, I live in Oakland, California. I love Oakland, California. I moved there in 1996, and I'll be honest with you, I came from Missouri. I, Missouri's great, but I walked in, on, into Oakland, and I said to my, I turned to my wife, and I said, oh my gosh, I'm home. And why did I love it? I loved it because it's diverse, it's vibrant, you can meet different kinds of people, et cetera, and they have one thing in common. They love Oakland. And their love of Oakland means they're gonna try. Now we get a meeting in the press and, and some of it is probably uh, you know, relevant and deserved, but I still love it. But when I wanna think about how to make Oakland better, you know where I come? San Diego. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I come to San Diego and I think about, I meet with people who are doing workforce housing or um, I met with someone who's working with the criminal justice system, you know, endured for my Zip Code Economies podcast to move uh, people as they move out of incarceration into jobs. And I said, how do we do that? How do we think about that? So I talk to people here in San Diego because you do have that same thing. You have that thing where people who live in San Diego are proud to live in San Diego. You recognize all the problems you have and you want to make it better, but you did it, guys. I mean, you're proud, right? So I think capitalize on that. Put your, your, your things together. And one of the things we're thinking about at, in the Fed, one of the powers we have is to convene. And our community development group and our regional executives that have a footprint all over the, the nine western states, we're meeting all of people like you all over, Salt Lake City, Boise, Idaho, you know, outside of Portland, and we, and everybody's thinking about the same problems, but we can convene all of you to share with each other how you're thinking about things and learning, and this, the lesson's gonna be the same. Align on some strategic goals and do partnerships with public, private, and community to really get the job done. So thank you. Uh, you mentioned your podcast, Zip Code Economies, which I encourage everybody to like, get out your phone now and subscribe to. If you think, I can't subscribe to an, a, a podcast by an economist, it's too arcane, it, that's not the way it is. Um, one of the things that, that is I, how people think about it, though. That, <laughs> you tell you how I'm, I'm sure that you, you know, people are afraid, but it, it really is very accessible. And you, there is one great episode where you interviewed two twins who uh, worked with reality changers here. Yes, in here San in San Diego. Diego. And uh, yeah, cheers for reality changers. And um, and uh, yeah, it's a wonderful podcast. I encourage people to listen to it. Um, you also mentioned having two or three ideas. And back in the green room, you mentioned that you had two or three messages for your colleagues. And I wonder if you could share them with this audience. So what, what happened is we, every year we bring in our um, new board members. So we have boards of directors in all of our offices. So the San Francisco Fed has an, a head office in San Francisco, a branch office in LA, a branch office in Salt Lake, a branch office in Portland, and a branch office in Seattle. And that was original from 1913 to ensure that we have these nine western states and we have to cover uh, a vast territory. So the Salt Lake branch covers Idaho and parts of, of Nevada and Arizona. And then LA covers the, Nevada and Arizona. And you know, there's all these different groups are linked together. And we have Hawaii and Alaska. So we have then these boards of members, boards of count, board of directors members. And then we also have councils. We have an economic advisory council, a community advisory council, and a community depository institution advisory council, which we never say that whole word. We always say CDAC. Um, so we, anyway, these, all, these folks, these new members, all came to the bank this week, Tuesday and when, or Wednesday and Thursday. And all of our board and council members, the whole full teams came. And we introduce them to what we do at the Fed and, and why their service to us is so important. And I said, you're gonna hear a lot of things over the next two days, but I want you to remember three things. 
there's only three things that are really important when you start your service. And I think these are three things that I want all of you to remember about what the Fed is like. So the first thing is that the economy is about people. So we are not simply looking at the data and aggregate numbers and calculating models and looking at empirical work. We have that, we absolutely won't use that. But the thing that you always have to go back to is that the economy is about people. And you have to be out talking to people, business leaders, worker groups, community groups, civic leaders, if you're gonna understand the lived economy. That's why I spend time at retail outlets asking people questions. While it's a small data collection project that I do, it actually gives me the lived experience of the people. And that's why I have teams of people working at the San Francisco Fed who are about collecting this qualitative information that makes such a difference in how we can do our best work. The second thing to remember is that data are plural. Data is not a point, it's not six points, it is plural. And it's really like a pointillistic painting. If you think about a painting that's pointillistic, if you've never seen one, it's a million dots that make a picture that if you back really far away from it, you see only as a painting. But when you get up close, you realize that painting is made of all those little dots. And the artist had the patience and fortitude and persistence to ensure that all of the dots were made well, lined up, and gave the painting the depth that it has when you look at it from afar. The discipline that we need if we work at the Fed is to remember the economy and those data points, that's a pointillistic painting. And if we miss whole swaths of dots because we think we got it from afar, we will miss including lenses and voices that matter to us. And that brings me to the third thing that's important. Every voice, every lens, every perspective matters, everyone. And so we need to be making sure that we're out there talking to people. So I spend time in Alaska, Hawaii, rural Idaho, San Diego, downtown Oakland, East Palo Alto, you know, every state in the district we are going, and we're going to not just a community, not the fly-in city, but the communities that also make up the fabric of those locations. And my colleagues, uh, the beauty of the Federal Reserve System in 1913 is that the, the people who put this together, they put a group in Washington, the Board of Governors, and then they recognized the importance of, of knowing information from the communities that we're meant to serve, and they said, we're gonna have 12 regional feds, and those regional fed presidents and their teams, apart from their daily responsibilities to do payments and banking and monetary policy, we're gonna have them out there actually collecting information from the very people who are affected by our policies. And that has been a durable and important component of what the Federal Reserve banks do. And it's one of the reasons I love my job so much because ultimately you only make good policy if you're out there. So the economy is about people, data are plural, every voice, every lens, every perspective matters. You, you, you and I are similar in that when, when we go shopping, we pester people with questions. And um, I, I do that too. In fact, every restaurant I've been to recently, and particularly like fast casual places, I always ask, hey, do you mind me asking, what's, what's the starting salary here? Yes. And the, the dollars number I always get is 16 and something cents. So that's within a dollar of minimum wage. We have this $20 minimum wage in fast food coming, a $25 minimum wage, which you heard about in the business roundtable this morning for, for healthcare workers. Have you thought at all about kind of what do you expect that, what kind of impact do you expect that to have? Is that gonna to contribute to inflation here in California? Is it, is it going to reduce overall employment? Do you, do you have any thoughts? So this has been a long, long studied um, <laughs> economic topic and, and the minimum wage is, has been long thought about by economists and, and not just policymakers, like economists trying to figure out what the impact of the minimum wage is. And it really depends, right? It, when the minimum wage is raised, who it's raised for, whether the communities or the firms can bear it, et cetera. So I think there is no clear definitive answer about whether it reduces employment or you know, changes inflation. I don't think that's 
there's the in definitiveness there. And there's a big debate about whether it's better or not as good as just putting an earned income tax credit on. So if you get to the economics of it, you don't get a compelling answer. The minimum wage, and I'll, I'll just say it, is a social tool, right? For most of us, it's about not finding it very comfortable to think that people work a full-time job and can't afford to buy the gas to get there or feed their families. And that's what ultimately we have to decide as, as societies. I, you know, and the Fed doesn't play a role in that. It's just what we have to decide as societies. What can we bear? And then what have firms have to do is decide, okay, at that price point, do I need to hire fewer workers and invest in more technology? Do I need to change the equation? Do I need to hire different people? And ultimately, those things will work themselves out. But the, if you look to the economics to compel you on the minimum wage, you would find that there's a, just a range of views and a range of findings, and it depends on what year you studied it. If you look at the, the reasons people often vote for the minimum wage or in the surveys what people say about the minimum wage, it really is that they find it extraordinarily uncomfortable to repeatedly be confronted with the fact that every people who are doing their jobs and doing everything they, the way they should cannot afford the basic things of living, transportation, housing, and food. And that's just hard. Yeah. Thanks. Um, for those of us who don't get to go to the Federal Open Market Committee and cast a vote, could you tell us a little about how that decision making works? You, you said something that was kind of surprising when we were meeting with the students earlier about it. Sure, this. sure. Um, so this is a, it, it feels like it's all behind the scenes, right? Because we don't, it, we don't the meetings are, are closed door. So let me tell you the things that I can, they're all confidential, so I can't share the, the details of what we do, but I can share the thing that, that I think was it's, it was so meaningful to me the first time I went to the FOMC. I went as a staff person. Um, you're only allowed a limited staff, uh, too, and so, as, as, as people know. But what is really remarkable, and I think it's one of the reasons, one of the key, one of the main reasons I love the Fed so much, is the independence that we have is given to us by Congress is, is cherished and closely um, built, right? We build it. And the way we build it, there are many ways we build it. There are many ways we earn it, basically, the right to be independent, the importance of being independent. One of those ways is the FOMC is a big room. And we live in, all of us live in society. So every, every FOMC participant lives in society, lives in their communities. When we cross a door, it's much like that door. You open big double doors, you cross a threshold. And once people cross that threshold, there is never a mention, not one, of politics, of issues that would be politicized. What we talk about is the economy, our goals, our mandated goals of full employment, price stability, what we need to do, and we debate, fiercely debate and discuss with big differences in how people see things, one, from the way they bring their, the information and, and how they, where their communities are, and then we come to a collective decision. And so it really is, exactly what you would hope for if you were an American, is people are doing the job they were asked to do without the, 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 the noise of thinking about politics or any other thing that they have on their minds. And I think that's a really cool thing. The thing that I told you that is really important is I've come on as a voting member this year. And while that is true, I'm a voting member, Reserve Bank presidents rotate, that's actually not meaningful from the way the FOMC works. The 12 Reserve Bank presidents rotate their voting, but every one of us is as meaningful as a voter or not a voter. It doesn't matter. We build our, our influence and our reputation based on evidence, what we bring to the table, how we reason the arguments, and what that tells you ultimately is that the FOMC is a construct where the best idea wins, right? And, it's, and the best idea is the product of the collective membership, debating, discussing, and dis deciding what are we gonna do for the American people. You know, at the front of our bank in San Francisco, at the head office, we have um, a sign. I put it up the day I became president. It says, and we, it's like a touchstone. That's why I keep putting my hand up. It says, our work serves every American and countless global citizens. 
And when the FOMC comes in, I feel like we have that touchstone, even though it's not there. They have Latin words on the, on the wall. But it really is, our work serves every American and countless global citizens, and we take that responsibility very seriously, and that's how we do our business, voting or not. I love that. Um, I am going to be looking at some of the questions that have come sure. in. So when I look at my phone, don't think that I'm ignoring you. Uh, I but won't. The, the last question I'll ask you is whether you could talk about your personal process for decision making sure. and particularly those three points. I can. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So I was saying to the students, since, oh, by the way, Rick said it, I just give a big pitch for this. So I met the stu some students here this morning. I did the business roundtable, then I met, went to meet with students. Uh, Boy, we are lucky. Because these students, they were impressive, they asked thoughtful questions, very well considered, and just in dialogue. And the thing I always like when I meet young people is that I see the hope in their eyes. But what I love even more is when I see the hope in the, in the practice, when they have the, the idealism and the hope, but they put it with the skills and the wherewithal and the thought process and asking hard questions and challenging. So. If you ever need inspiration, just ask for a meeting with you know 10 or 15 students here, or anywhere probably, but definitely here, and you'll see what I saw, and, and I, can't, I walked away um, feeling terrific. But one of the students asked me about, you know, how do I think about things, how do I think about policy, and the very first uh, day I became president, I was giving a town hall for the bank, and someone asked me, well, how are you gonna make policy? That's really hard. And I said, well, and I have stickers now. I don't, I don't even know if I have any more with me, but I made them into stickers because I want everybody to know sort of this is a life thing you could use too. But here's how I make policy. I'm voraciously curious. I mean, voraciously curious. I wanna look at everything, talk to anybody I can, look at the models, read history, put it together, figure it out. When I get to the meeting, I'm confident about the decision I've made because one, it's so important, I better be thoughtful and confident, but also because I've done all the homework. And then the day I make the decision, I'm humble. Humble about what have I missed, what can I learn tomorrow, and I go back to voraciously curious. And this virtuous cycle of be curious, be confident, be humble, is how I make policy, and that's what I put on the sticker. And when I told the students, I said, no matter where you go, if you use those three things, you're gonna be successful. I love that. Um, we're gonna go on to some questions from the audience. Oh, terrific, I love so audience questions. One of, the, one of the first questions is, um, 2024 may be a critical year for the commercial property market. Mm -hmm. um, to what extent will this affect regional and local economies and banks? Sure, that's a terrific question, certainly on the minds of, of many, many people. So it is true, just for those who don't follow commercial real estate markets, that commercial real estate, much of it is, is repricing, refinancing this year. Right, because when people, uh, leasers, owners, et cetera, found that they were, um, that interest rates were gonna rise, they locked in low interest rates, but many commercial um, interest rates for commercial properties are on three-year cycles. So now the, the refinancing is coming, and you have to redo it, and so you redo it, but now you're at higher interest rates. And so that's the, if you hear people say they're reckoning, that's the reckoning, right? There'll be this reckoning. Now, that is going to be something that has to be gone through. So what can you say in the back of your mind to say, okay, how bad will that be? Well, let me offer some things. So commercial real estate is a big word that covers a lot of diverse sectors. Not all commercial real estate is the same. So you can break it into um, multifamily housing, warehouses and storage space, and office space. But even office space has to be broken down into city office space, which is where a lot of the workers left, and suburban office space, which is doctors, lawyers, title insurance companies, you name it, and they're fully in person. So they're still there. So that space in the suburbs and in places where you're really filling it with those kinds of in-person service providers, that's not at risk. And industrial warehousing is booming. And multifamily is, we're still, we have too few units, so that's not as at risk. So what's really problematic is this downtown office space. And, and so then downtown office space, well certainly regional banks have some 
skin in those games, but they're not the big investors in those spaces. Those are usually conglomerated investment pools. They have a variety of different investors, and they will have to find another, another method of, of funding themselves. And so I, we had a commercial real estate roundtable uh, late last year, and I asked people, we had private equity firms and commercial real estate um, owners and, and leasers, banks, and what we heard in that, now I'm gonna narrow it down to this office property, since that's where the worrisome pieces are, is that these, these folks have known this. The reckoning's not a surprise. It's been being planned for, people know it's coming, and they've started triaging. So there are certain properties, class, if you've got class C office space, then you're probably trying to figure out how to lease that to doctors, lawyers, you know, other people say, move closer, class C is available, we don't have the competition for it. If you have class A space, well, it's beautiful and you can find different, you know, people. So in downtown San Francisco, where people say the end of the world has come, especially if they don't live there. Um, you know, we did have big companies you've heard of move out in the tech space, and then AI is moving in. So, you know, people do come when that space is available and the price point is right. So the real piece of the puzzle that's in trouble is that Class B space, where it's not new, it's not that attractive, it's not going to attract the new techie people. It would use a lot of investment, and there's so much Class A sitting there, why would you do it? And it's too expensive or big for the, for the smaller office places, so that will be the place. And then some, some of the owners or leasers are saying, well, I'll just, take it to ground. And I don't know that they always mean tear it down, they mean turn the lights off and wait for the times to be better, and they can do that. And then there are other private equity firms who are like, at some point the price point is gonna be sufficiently good that I can swoop in. So the, from the Fed's perspective, what I worry about, or as a policymaker, what I worry about, or what I think about, I'm, I wouldn't even say worry, I would say what I think about on commercial real estate is, I wanna understand what the drag on the economy will be, and so I, I'm focused on that. And I also want to understand what the stress on, in, on the banks will be. And so we're monitoring that, thinking about that, regularly talking to all the entities. And everybody knows it's coming. And they've been working and planning for it. So now it's just, as it starts to go through and digest, it's about how does it shape up for any particular uh, firm. Yeah. That's helpful, thanks. Um, uh, you do you think that a solution to the economic gaps across the country can be solved by increasing access to higher education? There seems to be a shift in employers relying more on soft skills or maybe on a skills-based hiring rather than degrees and specific job training. We were just having this conversation earlier uh, today in the, in the round table, and we were also having this conversation, um, I've been doing various um, events and outreach events, and even in San Francisco, when we're having this exact conversation about what are firms doing. So firms have known for, I mean, it's been, it's been in conversation for like the last four or five years. Do we really need to wait for a person to get a four-year degree only to provide them on-the-job training or ask them to go get the certificate when we need very specialized skills? Or could we just take them out of high school and give them this training? So that gets talked about a lot, but nothing gets done much about it. But the shortage of workers has put a highlight on that. And so now we're hearing more firms in all kinds of sectors, a wide range of sectors, just hiring and, and running people through certificate programs and running through people through training programs. And then that's caused a surge in interest among community colleges in thinking about how can we provide those training certificates. And, and so there's a, a, a college in Utah, the University of Utah, U, uh, Utah Valley University, where they're most, they were a community college and now they also offer four-year degrees. They're just looking for, okay, what do these need and what skill sets can we, can we get and get people into jobs quickly? So I think that what we're seeing is a transformation. That transformation is far from complete. It's gonna require really a mindset shift Employers are going to have to not only desire to do skill-based training, but actually push it down into the organization so that people realize you don't always need the college degree signal if you've got the skills. But then you have to have skills-based hiring metrics and other things, and that's, that has a chance to really equalize things, but we're not there yet, but we have to work on it. And I'm hearing that, firms are working on that. On the other side, we have to think about 
How do we get more certificate programs and more training programs, more what I would call divisible educational opportunities, where you go and maybe you get a six-month certificate, you work, you say, okay, now I can take a year, I get a year-long training program, but we don't really have that much infrastructure for this. And so right now, I think we're in that transition period, And but it's certainly it's like part of the conversation. Here, much less, I've long been a proponent of college, because you can look at the data and it lifts up, but someone asked me, wouldn't you be for apprentice programs? And I said, absolutely, if we have them. <laughs> but if I tell you know communities from you who are historically disadvantaged, go get a training program. There's like no, none available. So the, there's two choices. You know, you have, you can stop at high school or you can go to college, but if we can fill that gap, well, yes. And the important thing, and this is something else that I said is, or that I believe, because I've been all over, it won't just be for people who can't afford college. It'll be for people who don't want to be in college. And there are a lot of those people who don't come from disadvantaged backgrounds. They just, they just want to do something different. They want to work in different things and they don't want four years to get there. And, and so I think we have to, that's why I say it's a mindset shift. We have to change our mindset to get people what they need and when they need it. Yeah, you, one, of the, one of the things that you talked about just now, but also earlier in the, in the business round table was that it's not just about at the very top level of a CEO saying, we're gonna hire people without bachelor's degrees now. It's employment is competitive and there's two people and often it's tempting to just pick the one, and it, often it's just tempting to pick the one that's got the degree. And, um, and one of the things that I've talked about with, with businesses, particularly when I was at the Workforce Partnership was if somebody has, to, has acquired those skills without the benefit of a degree, Often that's an indicator that they're more of a self-starter, that there's somebody who have overcome often, often obstacles to get those skills, and that's why it's so important to hire people like that. But. Well, I think one of the ways that we make sure that we are doing it effectively and in a way that has sticking power, staying power, is if we're saying we're gonna do skills-based hiring, then let's have skills-based metrics. And that's what I'm seeing missing in many organizations. They say, okay, we're gonna go do skills-based hiring, and it doesn't last beyond a tight labor market. But if it is embedded into the hiring manual, into the assessment you know, papers, and you, know, you basically have the interviewers asking skill-based questions, then you actually have a chance for that list living past the, uh, just the tight labor market. So you know, these are things that, again, I just want to be very clear. The Fed plays no role in these things. We don't, I don't have any tools for these types of things. So why do I talk about them? Why am I even willing to talk about them? It's because we have a mandate of full employment. And in order to achieve full employment and really think about what that means, we have to have a workforce and in order for the workforce needs, the demand for workers to be met without being inflationary, we have to have a workforce that can match it. So when people ask me, what do you think we need to have demand and supply come together? Well, I can say we can keep raising the interest rate to make sure demand doesn't outstrip supply, but we can also work on the supply part. I can't control that, but I can definitely identify where the gaps are. That's great. Um, I'll ask you one last question and then we'll send people off to break. And you You've talked about your vision of the San Francisco Fed as a public service organization. And I just wanted to know if there was any examples you'd like to share or kind of how you realize that vision of the San Francisco Federal Reserve Bank being a public service organization. Actually, it's a premier public service organization. <laughs> and, I, and the reason I say that is that we are in public service and I think everyone who works at the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco or any Federal Reserve in the system understands we are in public service. But you're absolutely right. When I took the job as president and in my interview to get, in many interviews, to get the job, they asked me, what's your vision? Why do you want this job? And I, I said, the, the, Fed, the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco and Federal Reserves across the system, they, we have all the tools and capabilities. We're mission driven, we're earnest, we are sophisticated, we're well trained. We wanna put all of that to being really a premier public service organization, the best in public service. And what that means is not simply doing our job well, 
It's actually figuring out how to continually do it better and to serve more people and to meet people where they are and source more information and build trust. You know, ultimately, someone asked me, what's your most important tool? And I think they wanted me to say the Fed funds rate. But I said, trust. Public trust in our ability to do our work and our willingness to meet our commitments is our most important tool. If people, and I'll give you an example of that from this year, last year. If people believe when we say we are gonna bring inflation down to 2% and they believe it, well then they buy into it. And then they say, okay, inflation is gonna come down. And if you look at inflation expectations for consumers, you see the more, as we speak, and then they get the data, they see inflation coming back down. The inflation expectations have just come down. So that's a measure of our credibility. And our credibility can only thrive when trust is high. And so that's what being a premier public, a premier public service organization means to me. It's ensuring that we build as much trust as possible. We talk to people who don't understand or even agree with us. And we do it with openness, transparency, and respect for their views and their questions. And that's what my team and I uh, strive to do every day. President Mary Daly, thank you very much for joining us. We're gonna have a short break. Uh, also, that did not mean to drop a mic. Um, uh, we're, we're, we're gonna have a short break, and uh, before we go, if there's a Rodney Colburn, they've lost their card, so um, uh, find Lauren. Sure. Sure. Okay. Um, all right, we're on a little break, and we'll be back here in five minutes.